Good evening and welcome to tonight's conversation with pastor, preacher, professor, draft resistor, disciple of nonviolence and all around holy troublemaker, the Reverend James Lawson. Reverend Lawson joins us tonight from his home in LA to share words and wisdom this one week before a new presidential inauguration and just one week after domestic terrorists stormed our capital and took aim at American democracy. In the words of the psalmist, the nations are in an uproar and the kingdoms totter. Just this morning, our congregation, the New York Avenue Presbyterian Church was forced to evacuate our building due to a suspicious package discovered by the Secret Service. Now, due to our location, this is somewhat par for the course, and yet the violence of last week has intensified the need for people of faith to not just name what is wrong in our midst, to not just feel bad about evil, but in the words of one of our guests this evening, the Reverend William Lamar, to pick fights with the demonic. So tonight we gather to learn and to organize in order that white supremacist violence will not be allowed to control the narrative, to clog our airways and stifle justice, to dictate who we will be as people of faith. We are here tonight to sit at the feet of wisdom, to be nourished and challenged so that we may walk into this new year continuing to dismantle the wrongs that Reverend Lawson has dedicated his life to fighting. Racism, sexism, violence, and what he aptly calls plantation capitalism. We are grateful tonight for your presence and we are better because you have chosen to be a part of tonight's conversation. Perhaps you are grieving or raging, or agonizing, or still in shock. Perhaps you are weary and worn out, or ready and steady, or unsure and, and still pondering a commitment to nonviolent disruption. Whatever you are feeling tonight, we welcome it. Thank you for showing up to help discern how we move forward as a country and as people of faith. Please join me in prayer as we ask God's wild and Holy Spirit to show up too. Let us pray. Holy God, Holy Spirit, we cannot get the images out of our heads. An angry white mob welcomed onto federal property. The noose, the Confederate flag, the weapons, the words, the symbols of hate cannot get them out of our heads. Images that trigger other images of lunch counters and lynchings, of sanitation strikes and voter suppression of other angry white mobs at schools and churches shouting that only those with white skin are welcome. Powerful and painful images and yet tonight we gather to begin to paint new images, to fight back with beauty, not violence. To remember as hard as it is to hear that even the enemy has a spark of God inside them. And despite all of what we are feeling this night, we can hold people accountable without dehumanizing them for we know that the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. Hold steady our leaders, O oh God, protect them from violence and harm, give them courage to meet this moment, not with denial and whitewashed sentiment, but with action and accountability. Hold steady our hope, O oh God, that we not forget that justice is more than a dream it is the divine intention for this world. And you show up, O oh God, whether our hopes are high or in complete disarray. Hold steady our truth, O oh God, that when we are overwhelmed or, or so privileged that we contemplate quitting, 
but you remind us that power of love is always stronger than the love of power. Tonight we pray in the name of Jesus the Christ, the Prince of Peace, your Son and Savior, who was never, ever afraid of getting into holy trouble. Amen. Thank you very much, uh, Heather. Uh, I want to add my welcome. Uh, I'm so glad to have you with us tonight. I'm Theo Brown. I'm the director of the McLennan Scholar Program at New York Avenue uh, uh, Presbyterian Church. Um, the purpose of our program, some are familiar with it, others may be new to it, is to sponsor programs throughout the year that feature scholars and authors and theologians and activists and other thought leaders uh, who can help us deepen our faith so we can be more effective in our work in the world. Um, during the past few years, we've had many notable uh, Christian leaders, other thought leaders uh, come and speak in our program. We've had uh, James Cone, uh, Walter Brueggemann, had Reverend, now Senator-elect, Raphael Warnock speak in our program, uh, Kelly Brown Douglas, uh, Sister Simone Campbell, James Foreman Jr., Corinna Gore, E.J. Dion, many others who have been McClendon scholars, and uh, we are um, we're delighted for the ways that they educate us, challenge us, and, and push us to apply our faith in daily life. Um, tonight, of course, we have a very special guest. Many things can be said about Reverend James Lawson, but one clear thing should be said at the start. He is an American hero. His work in helping to spark and sustain the civil rights movement in the 1950s and 60s changed the course of history and helped heal the soul of our country. We are deeply grateful for his life and work and honored to have him join us tonight uh, as a McClendon scholar. We're also thankful you've chosen to be here with us and we really look forward to a great program. We have many people from congregations and organizations in the DC area, as you saw, if you signed on early. Um, and we also have people from all around the country with us and we're delighted for that. Well, I admit to being very tired of Zoom meetings and uh, badly missing some things that I used to take for granted like applause audience laughter, and group singing. The one great thing about webinars is that people can tune in from literally anywhere in the world. And we're glad many of you have taken advantage of that. And as a result, there are several hundred people on this call probably who certainly could not have attended a program uh, in downtown Washington, DC. So we're thankful to have you and, and no matter where you are uh, checking in with us from tonight. I also want you to know we're joined by a, about 150 or so youth and adults who are associated with the Community Club at New York Avenue Presbyterian Church. The Community Club pairs DC public high school students with tutors from across the city and they meet every Thursday night at this time uh, for tutoring and guidance. As their lesson for tonight, they're all tuning into this program and we're very pleased that these students will have a chance to learn about Reverend Lawson and hear his message. Now, as we go forward in our program, there'll be two ways that you can participate directly. One is through using the chat function, as we did earlier. And secondly, through the Q&A function, which is next to that down at the bottom, if you haven't spotted that yet. Now, I want to emphasize the difference between chat and Q&A. And and ask you to sort of follow these guidelines. If you wanna make a comment, ask a question about the webinar of one of the panelists or one of the staff, um, then use chat. Uh, near the end of the program, we're also gonna pose a question to you uh, and invite you to type in something into chat and we want that in the chat function. Now, if you wanna ask a question of Reverend Lawson, then use Q&A. Don't use it for general comments or just to express specific concerns. Put that in chat. Q&A also has a function 
where you can like certain questions. Uh, so if you go into questions and you have one in mind or you're thinking of what to ask and you see a question you really like, click like on that and then we'll know which questions are more popular and which should go to the top of the queue when we have limited time. We're not gonna be able to answer anywhere near all of the questions and we may actually have a little less time than we sometimes do for that, but we'll get to as many as you, we can and if you use the like function, uh, that will really help us. All right, I wanna explain now how the evening will proceed and then we will hear from Reverend Lawson. Uh, in just a moment, uh, Reverend Joe Daniels is going to introduce Reverend Lawson. Many of you know in the Washington area, particularly Reverend Daniels, he's the pastor of Emory United Methodist Church on Georgia Avenue up in the, Brit, uh, the Brightwood neighborhood of uh, Washington, D.C. Um, Emory is a wonderful congregation and under Joe's leadership, they're actually involved in many different kinds of uh, community service. Reverend Daniels knows Reverend Lawson uh, through some family and uh, Methodist ties in Los Angeles. And uh, uh, it was through his connection that we were able to arrange this program this evening. After his introduction, uh, Reverend Lawson will give his presentation and we look forward to hearing whatever he wants to share with us this evening. After his talk, Reverend Daniels will then engage Reverend Lawson in some questions and conversation uh, and draw out some of uh, his thinking and explore different ideas um, uh, with Reverend Lawson. After that discussion between the two men, we then will have time for some Q&A and you can begin to write your questions in uh, anytime during the presentation or when they're talking or afterwards. Um, and you can type, uh, we'll take some of those questions, answer as many as we can. Um, after the question period, we're gonna have some brief words of thanks for Reverend Lawson, and then we'll invite him to make a closing comment before uh, our pastor, Heather uh, Shortledge, will close our time together with a benediction. So I hope you'll stay with us to the end. Uh, we will close at 8.30 or very close to it. We run over it, won't be much, I promise you. And uh, we do hope you'll be with us at the end where you have an opportunity to write a message to Reverend Lawson, and we'll be sharing some appreciation of him and his work. And I now want to turn the program over to Reverend Joe Daniels, who will introduce James Lawson. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. What an honor and a privilege to be with you all tonight on this uh, historic moment in this historic time. Uh, we are grateful that in the midst of these chaotic and tumultuous times that we find ourselves in, uh, ironically, a day before we celebrate the 92nd birthday of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And just a week away, less than a week away from a very historic inauguration, uh, one of which we inaugurate the first woman vice president, the first African American and Asian American vice president. We are overwhelmingly blessed tonight to have a man share with us who truly is an American icon. Uh, he is an American legend. Uh, he was born in Uniontown, Pennsylvania. He grew up in Massillon, Ohio. Uh, he is one for whom Dr. King himself said was the foremost teacher on nonviolent resistance in America. Uh, he is the one from whom the, of whom the late uh, Congressman John Lewis called the architect of the nonviolent movement of America. He is the one literally who was summoned by Dr. King from uh, his work in Ohio. Uh, Dr. King said, come down here. We don't have anyone like you down here with us. And in coming to Nashville, he's very well known for his organizing with groups like CORE and SNCC and the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. And he is known well for his work in training some of the greatest civil rights leaders uh, of our time. People like Diane Nash and James Bevel and Bernard Lafayette and DC Mayor Marion Barry, as well as Congressman John Lewis. On a personal note, I'm just so humbled and honored to be able to introduce him tonight. He is a personal family friend of the Daniel side of the family in California 
uh, in Los Angeles. He used to pastor several of my relatives. His brother, Phil, pastored several of my relatives well in North, as well in, in Northern California. Uh, and he is a dear family friend. We thank God for him. May we welcome tonight none other than the Reverend James Lawson. So we're still waiting. Uh, our tech people are working furiously behind the scenes to make this happen. Um, I just chatted with Reverend Daniels and said, um, would you be willing to have just a little bit of, of conversation? I know you all did not come to this webinar to hear me or, or, or particularly Reverend Daniels be in dialogue, but that's what we have to work with right now. So um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to softball you a question, Reverend Daniels. <laughs> <laughs> about um, about what what Reverend Lawson has meant to your ministry and to your call to follow and teach and proclaim the gospel. How has he been an influence on your life? Well, he's he's meant everything. He's a, first of all, he's a third generation uh, Methodist minister, and and I'm a Methodist minister. And um, as one who pastored several of my family members in California, and again, his brother Phil. Uh, the same in Northern California. Um, I've always just been admired by his courage uh, and by his uh, steadfastness and about his fearless leadership. Uh, we need more and more courageous, strong, vibrant, visionary spiritual leaders in these days that we live in. And uh, Reverend Lawson has always embodied that for me. He's embodied, embodied that for our family. Uh, he has always spoke truth to power, uh, has faced consequences for it, but has uh, not uh, sh backed down or shied away from proclaiming truth. And that's always been a great, great, great uh, inspiration for me. I love the story of Dr. King calling him and saying, graduate school is important, but come on down. We, we need you here. And I... I think about that in my own life, what I have had the courage and the conviction to ditch my theological education to follow that call to do the work that Reverend Lawson, Lawson did. And then uh, he, he raised such holy trouble that he was expelled. Um, Vanderbilt didn't know what to do with him as a, as a student and, um, and, and said, we, you can't be here. Um, if that's not raising some holy hell, I don't know what is. Uh, very much so. Uh, and again, um, he uh, went to jail for what he believed in, um, spent a year in jail uh, because of his beliefs around the Vietnam War, uh, came back to school right after that, was undaunted, uh, graduated, finished. Reverend Daniels, any uh, insight uh, uh, for folks who um, who don't feel like they have that kind of courage right now? Um, the the kind of conviction and courage we see in Reverend Lawson yeah. is astounding, um, and I think some folks might come alongside that and say, I, "I don't have that." How do we foster that in folks? How do we nourish that in people of faith? I think it's always important for people to revisit our call. Um, those of us who've been in particular called to ordain ministry, but anybody who's been called to serve the Lord in any capacity, um, it is always important to revisit call because in revisiting call, we can embrace what God has done and wants to do with us from the very beginning. And I think it's, it's important for us to understand that, that when we say yes to God, we are gonna be taken uh, to places and spaces that we've never seen before, places and spaces that may be new to us. We're going to be in places of discomfort. Uh, this gospel that we proclaim uh, led Jesus to a cross. Uh, if it led Jesus to a cross, it's gonna lead us to a cross. And so part of accepting the call and saying yes is, is accepting the fact that there are gonna be challenges, there's gonna be persecution, there's gonna be suffering, but there's going to be triumph and victory 
uh, because we stand firm in what we believe and, and what we know uh, and who we know Jesus to be. And so um, the encouragement really is to, to, to embrace that call and to walk in it uh, and to not be afraid to keep moving forward and to, to do what we've been called to do and trust that Jesus will indeed care for us and, and for the people we serve. Thank you. I know many of your members are here and this might be repeat, but I'm curious, um, what did you preach this past Sunday um, as you walked into your pulpit or your living room, depending on where you are preaching from these days um, mm -hmm. after, after the events of last week? I, I happen to be preaching from my living room because uh, we've been ad advancing everyone to, to be safe. Uh, I was in the story of the Gerasene demoniac in Luke chapter eight, uh, in particular, uh, where um, Jesus um, heals the demon, uh, uh, heals the man, the Gerasene demoniac from many demons. Those demons were called legion. Uh, and so I, uh, through that uh, began to challenge America and began to challenge um, our national leadership and, and, and really challenged all of us uh, by, by really saying that we, we need to call out, uh, much like Jesus did, we need to call out the behaviors, the attitudes, and the habits that are not of God that are running through people uh, that cause there to be uh, hurt, pain, violence, disruption, and the like uh, on people. And in particular, I called our sitting president, current president, uh, into account in love. Um, and, and I called leaders around him uh, out in love to say, you know, he is suffering from illness of many sorts. He's struggling with legion. And it is, it is the, uh, the call of those who follow Christ to call it out, to name it for what it is, uh, and to, to work to heal. Uh, and also called for America to, to call out that which uh, oppresses us and that which um, uh, is not of God that is causing us to be sick as a nation. And that we need to, we need to revisit, uh, talked about on Sunday, we need to revisit our historical existence in this country. And we need to confess uh, that we are a country built on land theft. And we are a country that's been built on genocide of Native Americans and the original Mexican Americans and Black Americans. And that we are a country uh, that has suffered because of the enslavement of people of African descent. Uh, and that uh, slavery has been an issue that uh, this country has not resolved and it's resulted in a system of uh, supremacy and of white privilege uh, and in a system of racism uh, that many of us, even in the church, still refuse to resolve. And until we name those issues, name those demons, and then work to rise above them, um, we can't find healing, but if we, when we have the courage to do that, healing can in fact come, much like the, the, the demoniac in the text found I'm, I might even add, especially in the church, not just even in the church, but especially in the church. Thank right. you, Reverend Daniels. I, you weren't invited to come and preach tonight, but I just kind of put you on the spot and I really appreciate your willingness. Um, in, in preparation for tonight, I've been watching footage of Reverend Lawson and, um, watched his remarks at John Lewis's funeral. And he, he said some things that, that really struck me, um, particularly when they were trying to figure out how to do the sit-ins and, and how to organize that and, and what their response was gonna be. He, he said on national television, I was scared to death. I had never done this before. And black women really made the decision for us. And I, yes. I, um, I love the, the attribution to black women, I, but I also just knowing that such an icon and such a hero was scared and didn't know what he was doing and yet acted anyway, you know, moved forward in faith, 
despite not having it all figured out. Um, that was that was reassuring to me as as someone who sometimes feels like we are walking in the dark. Yeah. Um, yes, yes, very very much so, very much so. It, it's it's uh, the work we do takes us to scary places and scary situations. Um, and we would we would be disingenuous if we didn't say that there are moments when we are scared. Um, and you know we've had some scary times here in the city in this last week. Uh, but when we dig deep in our faith, we find strength to stand. And thanks be to God for God's grace for that. Very much so. I had I I, um, I had not heard the word plantation capitalism before I heard it come from Reverend Lawson. Um, you want to elaborate on that, or or what your how you define that, or what um, is that a term that you would use? <laughs> I do now. <laughs> I thought it was a profound, uh, profound term, um, um, and particularly as someone who is, is black and who whose family obviously has, like, like all black families, have roots to the plantation. Um, you know, you were under you were under master's rule. You were under master's arm, and and that was abusive. And that was uh, not kind. Uh, and that was uh, filled with all types of fear, all types of the unknown. Um, it was slave labor. It was hard work. Uh, and when you look at uh, this capitalistic society that we live in, uh, and you begin to identify who is master today, um, you begin to see a number of these same qualities, but yet in broader ways and perhaps in invisible ways. Um, we, we fail to see, there was a, a we, we fail to understand or not understand, but sometimes we fail to embrace or we don't even know at times um, the fact that almost 50% of adults who work in this country uh, earn an average annual income of $18,500 a year. Okay, who can live off of that? All right, so you've got people needing to uh, work two and three jobs just to survive. That, that's plantation capitalism, the, 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 the abuse of people through a capitalistic system that makes the rich richer and the poor poorer. Uh, and we are struggling with that. We're struggling with that as a nation and we need to confront that as a nation um, that if we are going to be a people of peace and a people uh, of healing, we need to create fair opportunity, just salaries for all people. Indeed. I was also struck by Reverend Lawson's um, in his reflections about his work that, that he was really kind of caught in the middle. He had to, he was, you know, on the receiving end of violence from whites, but also on the receiving end of skepticism from blacks and having to convince other black people that, that nonviolence was worthy of their attention and, and rooted in the spirituality of Jesus. And um, can you speak a little bit about the powers of persuasion and how we have to not only listen, but also uh, convince, persuade uh, folks that this way of nonviolence is, is the hope for the way forward. Well, the, the reality of it is, and we all, we all know it too well, that um, when we go to war, we, we, there's, there's, there's never peace when there's war. And when there's violence, there's, there's never really a resolution because um, if you've attacked someone, you know an attack is coming back and there's constant revenge on one another. And so really we need leaders who are willing to stand in the gap in that, in that space uh, that you have spoken about. Um, that is uncomfortable in nature, but that is consistent. Because uh, I, I believe people really are looking for sound, steady, confident, and consistent leadership. Uh, and when we see that in a nonviolent way, um, it is amazing how 
uh, that way of resistance prevails. Because at the end of the day, people want to, people want peace. At the end of the day, people want harmony. At the end of the day, people want to live in love. And as we're able to do that, um, God is able to move in and amongst us in, in phenomenal ways. So Reverend Lawson was 28 when he met Dr. King, fairly, fairly early on in, in his career. I'm, I'm curious, Reverend Daniels, what were you doing when you were 28? <laughs> well, at, at 27, I answered the call to ordain ministry. <laughs> 28, um, I, uh, my wife and I uh, celebrated our first child, our daughter, Joya. Uh, and I was a student in the seminary at Howard University School of Divinity. Reverend Daniels, I've asked a lot of, a lot of questions, put you on the spot. Do you have, do you have any questions for me? I, I, I want to know uh, how you are uh, finding pastoral leadership, particularly as uh, the new pastor of New York Avenue in the midst of the tensions of downtown and all that has taken place. Uh, how are you leading and living and preaching prophetically in this season uh, that we find ourselves in? I spend a lot of time on my knees. <laughs> Uh, it has been a, a wild year. I, I've been at New York Avenue for a little over a year and had big shoes to fill with uh, Roger Ginch's retirement. Um, but I'm the, the in-between person. So getting to name some things that need attention um, and, and maybe some holy speculation as they get ready for, for who is next. Um, but as you know, we're, we're a block and a half from the White House, uh, June this summer. Um, we were right in the thick of things and um, we figured out a way to open our doors and provide hospitality for those in the streets raising their fists and protesting um, despite a pandemic. Uh, we also had this great partnership with World Central Kitchen and Jose Andres and fed um, hot lunches every day in Triangle Park. So despite everything that was going on, not forgetting our neighbors experiencing homelessness. Um, so I'm, I'm pretty sinfully proud of the New York Avenue Presbyterian Church for the amazing work that they've continued despite a pandemic. Like every other church, you know, March 15th rolled around and, and we had to um, put 100% of our operations online, <laughs> meetings, uh, pastoral care, worship. As you can see, I'm also in my kitchen slash living room, and, and that's yeah. become my production studio where I preach from. Um, so it, it's it's been, um, in some ways, a wild and wacky year. And then in some ways, you know, this this is what the world is. We, we don't get to pick how things unfold or, or you know, we like to think we're in control and, and dictate those things, but but God continuously throws us curveballs, and and our job is to respond as faithfully as we can, and so that's what I've tried to do and model for this congregation. And um, they are good people who um, are continuing to be the church. Tell me how you how do you feel uh, seeing that the first woman vice president is coming to town. How, how, how do you feel about that? How does that make you feel, particularly as uh, a female leader at such a prominent church in the city? It's about dang time. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's my initial <laughs> response. Um, I, I uh, can't wait to watch her uh, model leadership and walk into these shoes. Um, I, I went to seminary not having ever seen a female in the pulpit or heard a woman preach a sermon. And um, so I am all about um, women in leadership and um, busting open that glass ceiling. And uh, I'm, I'm really excited. I think if I'm completely honest, I'm a little um, nervous after last week for her safety. Yes. Um, and uh, the risk that she is taking for all of us, um, but, but excited to have her voice in the midst and her 
uh, brains and the policy and the decision making. Um, really, really excited to have her in town. And what did you preach about last Sunday? Well, I was on vacation wow. <laughs> um, and yeah. I have a fantastic um, associate pastor, Rachel Pacheco, and we had a guest preacher and they um, faithfully held down the fort. And as you know, um, a pastor is only as good as his or her colleagues and her okay. staff. Um, <laughs> and, and I really have a great staff who um, held down the fort last week. And, you know, I touched base and I reached out and we, we collaborated, but I was able to stay on vacation. It's the first one I've had since the summer and really get some Sabbath rest. And so I was not in the pulpit this, this weekend, um, which was, you know, as a preacher, um, that is both um, somewhat of a relief and somewhat of uh, antagonizing, right? Like I have things to say. <laughs> um, and this is a week to say them. And yet um, I really, I need it to be about the rest and rejuvenation so that when I returned on Monday, I was ready for, for what is ahead of us. What would you have said? What do you think you would have said? You know that's a that is a that is a great question. I think um, I think for me, where I was getting stuck last week, as many have named, this is not this is not new. But um, we were we were in the streets and on the ground, and our doors were open in June when Trump had his photo op. We could hear the screams of folks from Lafayette Square being tear gassed. Um, we were a part of that aftermath and. And there were Black Hawk helicopters buzzing our steeple, and there were um, tanks on every corner of our building, and there were um, unbadged armed law enforcement everywhere. So the, the distinction in the response between the people in the streets in June and the people in the Capitol last week um, was mind boggling, and it, it shouldn't be. Um, but it, but it was, and so I'm, I'm stuck there. I'm really trying to sort through how, um, I'm, I'm trying to sort through that. And, um, I, I, um, I, I got a question. I have a, a nephews who are, um, seven and eight and they, they call me, uh, Dr. Auntie Heather. And they, they said, Dr. Auntie Heather, why, why was there a man with a, a flag that said Jesus storming the Capitol? What did, what did Jesus have to do with wow. what they were doing? Wow. And that really stopped me in my tracks because I think as adults, we are struggling with all of this, but how do you explain this to, a, to your nephews? And right. um, so we had a, a a decent conversation. I'm not sure I was profound, but we had a decent conversation about um, the things that Jesus stood for and how sometimes people like to, to claim that Jesus is on their side. It makes them feel right. It makes them feel powerful. It makes them feel important, um, but they really don't understand who Jesus was or what Jesus was about. And I said that um, I think Jesus would have been under the pews under the seats with those trembling elected leaders mm. who were wondering what mm. is going to happen here. Yeah. Am I going to survive? Yeah. Heather and uh, Joe, if I could join in here and come in, um, we're still struggling to get Reverend Lawson. We're trying to get him just to call in, but since we're here and we, I want to shift this a little bit as we still wait for him. We still think we're going to get him to join us. We'll know in a couple minutes for sure, but you know, we have several guests here that we brought in who are going to give some testimonial and tribute to Reverend Lawson. And I thought maybe to bring them into the conversation. Uh, in particular, uh, there are two people here who uh, uh, know a great deal about his career and have worked with him. Uh, there's some others we can call on for some words of tribute also. But Taylor Branch is here who many know as one of the great historians of the uh, civil rights movement, uh, author of the three volume trilogy on America and the King years. Uh, and also Bernard Lafayette is here. And uh, we, Bernard, if we could unmute Bernard and bring him out also, maybe we could just 
talk a little bit about the philosophy of Reverend Lawson and the contribution he made. We hope still to bring him on and talk with you. As I say, we had uh, uh, Bernard and uh, Taylor here as sort of surprises for him. Um, but um, and he may be real surprised if he does come on and see them. But if I could have them come on and, and, and maybe Taylor, you could pick up and talk a little bit about some of his philosophy and the impact it had and, and what you would add to what Joe and, uh, and Heather have already been talking about in terms of his, his importance in, in, in uh, the movement and for us today. Well, um, can you hear me? I'm happy to be here. Yeah, yeah we can, yeah. Thank you. Well, first of all, there's a lot of profundity here, but we need to recognize that it was not easy for a Methodist to be among all those Baptists in the civil rights movement. Um, they, they had different culture, they had different styles, all the, all the Baptists thought they were kings of their congregation. Um, uh, when Dr. King wanted to get Jim Lawson to move south from uh, Ohio, they actually met in a cafeteria when Dr. King gave a, a lecture. Um, his first instinct was to, he, he wanted to know who Jim's bishop was so he could call him um, uh, to, to try to arrange it through the school. Um, but he did ask him to come down. You know, Jim had been in India uh, and said it was one of the great ironies of his life that having devoted himself, decided to give his life to nonviolence um, with a father who he said carried a pistol um, uh, in Ohio when he was a young man. But he gave his life to nonviolence, resisted the Korean War, uh, and went all the way to India to study nonviolence under Gandhians, only to have the Montgomery bus boycott break out down in the South. And he, he said, not, I, I realized that mass nonviolence was being tried uh, in, in, uh, in our own country. And so he came back and met Dr. King and responded when Dr. King asked him to move south, saying he didn't, that there weren't people down there who, who, who knew how to train uh, uh, people in nonviolence. Uh, Bernard can speak better to that than, than me, of course, because he was in those first workshops in the late 1950s uh, on nonviolence. I'll never forget talking to Diane Nash about it. She, she went there because it was the only place that she heard that somebody wanted to do something about segregation, but she was dismayed when they said it was about nonviolence because she said, I'm a political science student. And in political science, we define government as a monopoly of legitimate violence. What can nonviolence do? What can the doctrine uh, associated with weakness do? And uh, she said Lawson told her that, um, that that was true only where real government failed, um, failing to, to mobilize the goodwill of people in, in, in votes and, and told her not to think of nonviolence as, as kookish and strange, um, but to remember that in America, we are a system designed on votes and we are troubled profoundly as we were last week whenever violence breaks out. So our republic is founded on nonviolence. If you believe in votes, you believe in nonviolence. You just don't realize um, that it's at the core of your civic faith as well as your spiritual faith. Um, and he, can, he persuaded Diane to stay. Uh, and she became one of those women uh, who was uh, pretty darn forceful in nonviolence. And in fact, I believe Diane Nash initiated many of the things that expanded the very identity uh, of the movement. She was the first one to go from Nashville, where she was in Lawson's workshops, to Rock Hill, South Carolina, to go to jail in somebody else's local movement. People thought that was crazy. We've got enough trouble here. But she said, this is a big movement. And uh, she refused to let the Freedom Rides die when the adults were so battered in, in, in uh, Birmingham, uh, Alabama. She interrupted a picnic um, in Nashville and said, we've got to go down there and continue the ride. So she, ex she kept expanding that. So um, the discipline and the, and, the, um, and, the, and the thought to realize that, that Christian faith and democratic faith 
is, is a profound commitment of, of your whole self, your, your mind, your will, uh, your faith, your heart. And, um, and that's what made Jim so fierce. So um, I'll just start with that. It was, it was uh, a wonder to get to interview him. Gosh, it's been 30 or 35 years ago. I, I can't remember uh, out in LA several times and, um, and, and elsewhere. So I just think he's a treasure and I, I hope we get to hear him. Um, I, Bernard Lafayette was part of those first uh, workshops back in 1959 and 60 in Nashville. Um, Bernard, can you hear me? Can you unmute yourself there and, uh, and join us and, uh, in this conversation? I know I saw you on earlier. Um, there you are. Uh, be sure to unmute yourself, Bernard. You may need to, maybe we can do that for you. Uh, there you are. Yeah. Um, great to have you with us, uh, Bernard. Say a bit about anything you want, but those early workshops maybe that back in Nashville and, and their impact on you and, and how you got involved with Reverend Lawson. Well, uh, <clears throat> before I start, I wanted to ask you, would there be a problem if Jim Lawson just simply talked on the telephone? We, we're trying to arrange that, and uh, he's having trouble even doing that. I'm not quite sure why. We're, we're a little, we're baffled. We're not sure why, but we're trying to do that right now. Well, so, what you uh, can do is just dial your number and you can put your phone next well, to the microphone. True. I think that's low tech. We could do that. Let me try about that. You, you talk a little, see if we can do that as something, as a way to do this. Yes, we could do that. Okay. Can do movement. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that's what we used to do it in Nashville. We had uh, someone who always stayed next to the, uh, <clears throat> the the telephone on the street in case if someone got injured. So we are uh, used to using the telephone as a way of, you know, part of the movement. Okay, that was part of the, the whole uh, strategy uh, with the movement, and that is to use the telephone. That's how we organized mass meetings in Nashville. There was a lady who couldn't go to the meetings because she was handicapped and homebound. But her job was to simply call on the telephone 10 people who then uh, actually called 10 other people. And those 10 people called 10 people. So it's called a telephone tree. And as a result of that, uh, she was able to mobilize a mass meeting in one hour. Then she'd stay on the talk show <laughs> and she kept waiting and dialing and dialing until she got in. And then she would, uh, instead of asking the question of the host on the telephone, she would say, there'd be a mass meeting at six o'clock at First Baptist Church. <laughs> <laughs> Those days they didn't have any delays and the, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, those are strategies that we use to organize. And uh, Jim Lawson uh, was the person who trained all of us. Uh, that is Marion Barry, who ended up being the mayor of Washington, D.C. Okay. Uh, there were Meharry students, and these were doctors, medical students. Now, we wouldn't allow them to go to jail because we didn't want any of our future surgeons and doctors to miss any classes. They needed all the classes they could get. Now, the preachers, we wanted all of them to go to jail, okay? <laughs> That's what they're going to be preaching about, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> they had the actual experience. <laughs> but uh, Jim Lawson was the key to turning my life in the direction which I wanted to go. When I was a little boy in, in Tampa, Florida, uh, back in the day, I had an incident on a trolley car where my grandmother 
uh, and I were catching the trolley car. In those days, you had to put your money in the front next to the conductor, and then you had to get off and then walk to the back on the street to the back door. Well, we were running after we put our money in there because uh, I wanted to jump on the uh, steps to hold the door open. And they, uh, well, the driver took off because my grandmother fell. But I said to myself in that time that when I get grown, I'm going to do something about this problem. So it was when I was at the American Baptist College there, and John Lewis was my roommate. He tried to get me to go to these workshops. If they hadn't put work in there, I'd have been okay. They <laughs> call them workshops. I said, man, I got enough work to do already. I was down to the second floor, you know, assistant librarian. And also I used to wash the dishes, the pots, at our cafeteria. And the reason I did that is because I could drink the pot liquor from the collard greens. <laughs> So I volunteered to do that. <laughs> so I said, okay, I'll go since John Lewis kept aggravating me. And when I got to that workshop, here's what happened. Lawson was able to connect. I mean, like these Baptist preachers, he was Methodist, of course. But he was able to get us to understand how we could put the scriptures that we have learned uh, together with social action. Mm -hmm. We always saw that as something political mm -hmm. and separate. But he was able to bring, okay, the uh, scriptures and the gospel into uh, a movement for social change. And that gave a good foundation, especially for preachers. That's why it was no coincidence that you had so many preachers coming out of uh, the, the movement because he was able to do that and put love into action instead of just in your mouth. How do you take love and put it into action? I was the one that was with Jim Lawson uh, when he, we were, you know, he was practical. We had people who brought up the rear when we were marching from downtown demonstrations. And I was with Jim, the two of us, Jim Lawson. And you know what? This, this, these white gang members, like you saw, okay, at the Capitol, came up and one of them got close enough to spit on uh, Jim Lawson. I was there. And, you know, I, I had to learn how to respond to that. Somebody would come up and spit on you. You know what Jim Lawson did? A witness. Jim Lawson asked the fellow who spat on him for a handkerchief. My God. <laughs> and the fellow just reached in his pocket and gave him the handkerchief. And Jim Lawson wiped the spit off him uh, himself and gave him back. And they started talking about uh, the hot rod, you know, and how many um, cylinders it had and all that kind of stuff. I didn't know anything about hot rods, so I couldn't even, but he knows about that. Lawson knows a lot of things. Martial art, by the way, is one of the areas that he's an expert in. Uh -huh. Yeah. So my point is, is what you do with the knowledge that you have. This fellow walked up, got so excited, the rest of his gang members left, and he was still walking with us all the way to the church. And he looked up and he saw he was at the church because he was so engulfed in this conversation. Because Lawson has a way of engaging people, getting people to think, not just with their mouth. Some folks can get folks to talk, but not, okay, engage. He had him so engaged. I remember the fellow, he had a black leather jacket on and his name was Danny. So his name was on the different. And then he looked up and saw the church. He said, oh, I got to go now. But I, all of the demonstrations we had since then, we never saw Danny again. So Jim Lawson transformed him by an act of violence on that person's part 
Jim Lawson took it and turned it around. Okay? So that's, I witnessed that, so I know. I, I learned from practical experience from him. And remember, Jim Lawson was arrested at the church, okay, in Nashville, because he was teaching us, okay. Yeah, they call it civil disobedience. It meant that you were breaking the law for them. So he was arrested then. But <clears throat> I've taken what I've learned from Jim Lawson all over the world. Yes. And there, uh, there is no single person who had uh, as much influence over the teachings. That's what I do now. AVP, Alternatives to Violence Project. Yeah. yeah I started in, in, in Greenhaven, New York, up in upstate New York, Greenhaven Prison. It is now in over 60 countries around the world. Yes. And Lawson was my teacher. And I learned so much from him. And the reason he is able to teach the way he does, you know how he teaches? Interrogatives. He gets you to think. You. He doesn't tell us what to do. Like the first sit-in we had in Nashville was not a protest. It was a test. We simply went down, sat in, to see how the people would react. Then, you know what we would do? We would return to the church and have what we call uh, social drama. Yeah, role play. We would sit on a, a, a chair, stool, and then some of us, the other of us, would then just knock the chair down and push people over and call them names and all that kind of thing. There's film footage on that, the Nashville City Movement. And what was going on? He was helping us develop our emotional strength. Yeah, you can be intellectual, you can be physical, but the point is, can you control your emotions? So we were practicing how to control our emotions when we got into those situations. It was called boot camp in the military. Okay? You go and you practice this and you not, so when you, something goes off like a bomb or whatever, you don't panic and run and, and your emotion loses. It was keeping yourself together under those circumstances. It's like asking for a handkerchief from the person who spits on you. For, That's what Bernard, power. Bernard, that that you make reference to that that story that um, David Halberstam tells in the children um, about you, you and you're involved in that incident where you're headed to a sit-in. Uh, one of the early ones, and uh, some people have been knocked down to the ground, and Reverend Lawson shows up. You're there in the story, and someone spits on him. Um, and he turns to the man and asks him, does he have a handkerchief? And yes. then he wipes the spittle off his face, and then he looks at the man and sees he's wearing a motorcycle jacket. And he says, oh, do you motorcycle or hot rod or what? And he began to have a conversation with this man who had just spit on him and completely changed the dynamic by treating this person who had spit on him and cursed at him as a human being. It's, it, it, it's a powerful, powerful story. And uh, as you mentioned that incident, that may be the one you're referring to, or there may have been other times like that also. But that story, when I read it years ago, it stuck with me. I, I think about it regularly. Yeah, I was there. Yeah. Yes, you were indeed there, as I heard the story told. I think yeah. you'd been knocked down to the ground, maybe even someone said, or someone had been. Anyway, it's mm -hmm. a powerful story, and I appreciate you evoking it. Yeah. So.
it looks like we're not going to be able to get him on. And I, if we look at our watches, we see that the time allotted here is we have a few minutes left. And I thought we, we, we will try to reschedule a time. And uh, we had checked his computer, had a rehearsal on Monday, and everything worked fine. Uh, he called me this evening, said he was having trouble with his computer. And we've been working with him for over an hour trying to get it to work. And uh, for some reason, it just never was able to work. I, I don't want to, you don't even really don't really understand what happened. And I'm, we're disappointed. And um, I, I, you know, so we apologize for that. We did practice as best we could on it. But I tell you, these stories have been great. And I see notes and comments in chat about the reflections and uh, people didn't get to know they were going to hear from uh, Bernard Lafayette and Taylor Branch tonight instead of James uh, Lawson. Why don't we take just a couple of minutes before we go? Uh, if you all have something you want to add, you can. But we also had uh, a couple of other people who were lined up just to make some comments of appreciation about Reverend Lawson. Again, what you're seeing now is the surprise portion of the evening. We were going to spring all these people on Reverend Lawson after he was finished uh, as a way of honoring him. Uh, so you got to hear the dessert first here. Um, but we have a couple of others who are going to just have brief comments, and I want to invite them to do that. And we'll draw to a close here in a few minutes, and, and then we will, of course, try to reschedule and, and double test everything. And uh, yeah, I wanted to invite, uh, you heard from Joe Daniels earlier. We have another Joe Daniels here. Uh, this is Joe Daniels' son, Dr. Joe Daniels. And uh, he has met Reverend Lawson and uh, it's had an impact on him. I want to invite you, Joe, to just uh, share your observation uh, with us. Absolutely. Um, just being a, a Black man in America growing up, um, you know, it was hard to always find superheroes in the mist. And I would say that James Lawson Reverend Dr. James Lawson is definitely a superhero uh, that I add to my wall. Um, having the blessing of, of, of knowing him through, through family has been great, but uh, I was actually able to meet Dr. Lawson about three years ago at my Aunt Elsie's uh, funeral out in California. And uh, he, he blessed me with the opportunity. I think the one thing for, for young people when they see icons is to be able to, to talk to them and, and share a moment. And oftentimes, you know, like certain icons or, or certain people in the public sphere are always bombarded. And, you know, and, and oftentimes it's, you know, kind of a, a cold experience. Um, but the one thing that has allowed him to maintain such a high level of influence is the fact that he shared in a conversation at a gravesite. And he took his time, he answered my questions, he, he spoke with me, and he challenged me. And I think that's the, that's the good thing and that's the key of Dr. Lawson. Like each and every experience he has as he's building community, as he's building relationships, he's always gonna leave you with the challenge to go forward and continue to, to leave a legacy, continue to grow, uh, continue to inspire. And so he gifted me with one of his books and I have pieced through this book, each and every word of it. And uh, it's been such a blessing just to know uh, that he is not just a, an icon that I can, I can read in books and watch on YouTube, but a man who's still walking and a man who, who leaves behind large footsteps. And as a leader in the Black community, especially out here in Northwest Arkansas, I'm happy to lead, but encouraged to know that I get to walk in his footsteps. Uh, so whenever I get to see him again, I just want to tell him always, thank you. Uh, I love him and I love you for all that you do. Um, Reverend Lawson, and continue to keep living and keep marching and allowing us to reclaim the democracy that we uh, continue to strive to, 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 to have here in this country. Also, shout out to Taylor Branch uh, for providing me with all of his books and autographing them. And uh, Reverend Lafayette, I have seen and read a lot about your stuff as well. And the one thing I want you to do tonight, if you could, if you could sing Buses Are Coming with Your Mouth Closed, because I watched that on Eye on the Prize and that touched me real good. And I've always tried to practice how to sing. Uh, better get your toothbrush, oh yeah. <laughs> you can take our toothbrush, oh yeah. You can take our toothbrush, <laughs> you can take our toothbrush. 
You can take our toothbrush. Oh yeah, that's that's, that's stuck with me, and I appreciate it for your uh, your tenacity, your grit. And I'm gonna end it there and just say thank you from a young yeah. black man uh, looking to make a difference in this country. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have a couple others I want to hear from just briefly, and then maybe a final comment from uh, um, Bernard Lafayette and Taylor Branch. But uh, uh, Alicia Gale, who's a student in the community club uh, that I mentioned earlier, is here, and uh, uh, we invited her as a kind of on behalf of the the youngest generation here uh, to just say a word about her appreciation for Reverend Lawson, her understanding of his work. So, Alicia, glad glad to have you for your comment. Um, hi. I actually had to write it down before I forgot. What I, so if I do glance down, I'm glancing at a paper. Um, I'd like to say that to say Reverend Lawson did a lot for the Black community would be a gross understatement. He not only risked his own livelihood for equality amongst all, he encouraged others to stand for what they believed in. When I was offered the opportunity to speak here today to you all, I immediately accepted as I was overjoyed to just be able to speak to such an influential figure and about a, such an influential figure. Reverend Lawson greatly inspired myself and I'm sure many others of my generation to get involved in issues facing the black community. Well, I had another part, but since he's not here, I can't really say it, but I just like to say, you know, if he happens to pop in, thank you so much for all of your work. Thank you so much, Alicia. Great to have your comment. Um, and the fifth person we'd invited to uh, say, uh, make some comments of appreciation uh, is someone else a lot of people in the DC area know, uh, uh, Reverend William Lamar of Metropolitan AME. Uh, not only is he pastor of Metropolitan AME, but he's co-chair of Washington Interfaith Network, which is a congregation-based direct organizing that draws its lineage back from the civil rights movement. And uh, so, uh, Bill, glad to have you with us. If you make just an observation of your appreciation on uh, of Reverend uh, Lawson and his work. P.O., thank you. I, I was taught and I read early on that when you are in the presence of elders and giants, you listen. And so it's been a pleasure to, to eavesdrop, to hear uh, Brother Lafayette, to hear Brother Branch, uh, to be in the presence of one of the founders of our organization uh, and my friend and, and mentor, Joe Daniels. Uh, I simply want to say that the work that you all can, that you began and continue is what inspires us to agitate, to organize, to be more than advocates, but to build the power to change policy and to change systems. And so we want to thank you all for your work we want to definitely uh, honor uh, Reverend Lawson. And I wanna encourage all of you who are listening to join with the Washington Interfaith Network to not just celebrate the history, but to know that we have a future to forge together. So join with us as we make Washington what it can and ought to be. Again, I'm honored to be in your presence. Thank you so much, um, uh, Bill. Um, we do want to draw to a close in a minute. We will, as I said, we'll try to reschedule this program. Maybe we'll invite some of these other guests back also. And uh, uh, we'll, we'll see maybe with a little different format next time. Uh, but delighted to have you here. Uh, and uh, Bernard, you have a, another word or another final story you want to share uh, uh, before, we, uh, before we close? We're so glad you're here. We're sorry you didn't get to see Reverend Lawson, but we're working on it. Maybe next time but delighted to have you and your, your comments. If you want to add a final thought. Uh, my final thought is this. <clears throat> We've got to institutionalize nonviolence where it's taught in universities and colleges. There ought to be a Saturday nonviolent workshop at churches. We've got to be able to use what we have learned and be able to share that. That's the only way that we can be able to make a difference. So I just want to, because of the sake of our time, just to simply say that. Now, if you insist that I sing, I don't mind, but let us hear from some others. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. And uh, Taylor, do you have a final comment? I just also want to say, uh, 
speaking of singing, I think we'll refrain, but it's Taylor Branch's birthday. And uh, we doubly appreciate him being with us today and uh, giving us time on his birthday night. But if you want to just offer a final, another comment, Taylor, it'd be great. I only, my only comment is I really hope you can reschedule uh, to, ha to have Jim on so that these people, all of these people that I've been, uh, we've been honored to ha have tuning in can, can actually experience it. I, I hope that that happens. And uh, I agree with Bernard. The way I would put it is we need to do something to make people realize how nonviolence is essential to our life. It's already part of it. There was violence in the Capitol and everybody said that violates all of America. And yet if you turn around and say, we are a system devoted to nonviolence, they look at you like it's odd because, <laughs> you know, so we need to change the way people think about the role of nonviolence in our institutions already and how important, what a great miracle it is to be able to have votes when countries all around the world, you know, still settle things with coups and, and that sort of thing. And, and uh, so I think the nonviolent mission is, is, is ahead of us and it is, it's, it's both sacred and, and civic. And uh, that's what makes uh, Jim Lawson and Bernard and, and all of the people who've been architects of that movement so important. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, and Joe, if you have just a word, and then we'll ask Heather to offer a benediction for us. And uh, we'll send you all an email about our uh, future plans and an effort to reschedule here, see what we can do. And uh, But this has been a blessing and uh, wonderful to hear some of the recollections and insights from you on the panel. I just Joe. want to say, I, I just want to say what, a, what an honor and privilege it's been just to, to be here and to, to share with uh, Heather, to share with uh, Taylor Branch and Bernard Lafayette. What a, what a history lesson uh, Mr. Lafayette was given all of us, just tremendous. And this, this whole call to institutionalize nonviolence, Lord have mercy. Um, I'm gonna get to work on that, sir. I'm gonna get to work on that. And I believe a whole lot of folks who are listening are gonna do the same thing. I think it's, it's tremendous. And so keep doing what you're doing. I hope we can reschedule this because I, I believe it's just gonna be a powerful, powerful time. God bless you and um, happy birthday, Taylor Branch. Thank you. Happy birthday. <laughs> <laughs> Best to Kate. All right, I was asked to do a benediction, but I'm gonna cede my time to Reverend Lafayette so that we can close uh, with your voice and your singing. <laughs> I think you just muted yourself, Rep. There you go. There. Reverend Lafayette, the floor is yours. <laughs> You're gonna sing, huh? Oh, so should I sing? Yes, sure. sir. yes, yes, please. Oh, okay, all right. Uh, music uh, is the uh, food for the soul, and uh. <clears throat> That's how we know we got a movement. Martin Luther King looked at whether or not we were singing songs about our own experiences. That's when we knew we had a movement. Well, this song about um, buses are coming was made up uh, on, uh, when we, on the Freedom Rides. We were in jail in Jackson, Mississippi, and on the third floor of the city jail, we could look down the highway and see the buses are coming. So we made up a song because we wanted the jailers to get ready. And I won't sing all the verses, but I'll just sing a couple of them so, but, uh, because of time. And so um, <clears throat> we struck out singing the song. Buses are a common, oh yes. Buses are a common, oh yes. Buses are a common, buses are a common, buses are a common, oh yes. And we told the jailers, better get you ready, oh yes. 
And then what they did is say, all right, stop all that singing and hollering here. This is not a playhouse. This is a jailhouse. You're not supposed to be singing and being happy in jail. That's what the crime was in jail. Okay? So we kept singing. And so they said, all right, if you all keep on singing, what we're going to do is take those mattress you got. And we made up a verse. You can take our mattress, oh yes. You can take our mattress, oh yes. You can take, and then we start piling up the mattress at the door and pushing them on out. We didn't want them anyway. You know why? They were just a, 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 those little tiny mattress. And two of us had to sleep on one mattress, end for end. The old people know what that means. One person's head this way and the uh, feet, the other person's feet that way. And then we got this imaginary line down the middle where you don't touch each other. Okay? So then uh, we kept saying, we got the mattress and piled them up and put them at the door and, and put them on out. Okay? And then uh, what we realized is that when we were singing, uh, we were already overcrowded, and we were going to be breathing on each other. So we learned how to sing with our mouths closed. Can you imagine that? Sing with your mouth closed? Yeah. And I'll just say this, and I'll be through. You take your lips, and you put your center of your lips together, no matter how big your lips are or how thin they are, you can still put the middle part together like that. Try it. Why don't you try to do that? Okay? Yeah. <laughs> you can take a mattress. Oh, yes. You can take a mattress. Oh, yes. You can take a mattress. You can take a mattress. We will keep our freedom. Oh, yes. We have to learn how to sing even with your mouth closed. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> yeah, Amen. Thanks be to God for Reverend Lafayette, Reverend Daniels, Mr. Taylor Branch, Reverend William Lamar, Alcia, Dr. Joe Daniels, and for our fearless tech team who worked and worked and worked. We will be back. Thank you. <laughs>